welcome to the Neutral Ground Podcast. I'm your humble host, Joe Meyer. So today we're going to take a deep dive into modernism. And if there are two words that can best sum up this major historical movement that takes place roughly between the late 19th century and just prior to the beginning of World War II, it's probably Kurtz's final words from Joseph Conrad's novella, The Heart of Darkness. The horror. The horror. Yeah, this is not a particularly happy movement, quite honestly. But it's a very important one for us to consider and learn from, because, as I mentioned in the first episode of this podcast, it's my belief that our current historical movement very closely aligns itself with modernism, which is why I'm, I'm calling our movement here, and others refer to this as well, I think neo-modernism best sums up our current state of culture, our current state of time here. So, where do we begin? Well, actually, the first place I want to begin is by clarifying some language. You might hear me every so often make a mistake, and it is a mistake, and refer to this time period as modernity. That's actually incorrect. Modernity refers to eh, roughly the changing of the world after 1500 or so, where we enter into what many scholars refer to as the modern world. And so modernity is technically any time after, again, that roughly 1500 mark or so. So we're in modernity right now, actually. Modernism is the correct name for the actual movement that takes place, for the collection of beliefs and ideas that come out of that movement as well, again between roughly the late 19th century and just prior to World War II. So, if you hear me saying, modernity is... please forgive me. It's a slip-up, and I should not be making it. I will do my best to avoid that today. So, how do we characterize modernism? Well, for me, modernism is best characterized as a kind of redefining, or a kind of, maybe a better way, is a re- reconceptualization and an attempt to reconstitute the human being against the, well, I'll just come out and say it, against the horrors of the modernization of the world. Again, doesn't this sound wonderful? Yeah. So, what exactly is so horrible about this? Well, you have within this major movement, you have quite a few different sub-movements and events that take place. For example, you've got the Flapper Age, right? Think of the works of F. Scott Fitzgerald often considered high energy, often considered kind of a, almost a wasteful time as well, in terms of wasteful spending. And then that leads, of course, to the panic and the crash. And you have economic depression. Think of the works of Steinbeck, of Mice and Men, The Grapes of Wrath. You also have the Harlem Renaissance, again, a time of great energy. Think of the works of Langston Hughes, And you also have the defining event of, of, I almost said modernity, you have the defining event of modernism, which is World War I. And of course, you can think of the works of Hemingway here, A Farewell to Arms. And even afterward, you've got The Sun Also Rises. Now, if that's not enough, you also have a loss of a religious sense. What I mean by that is, it's not just that they were grappling with the idea that Nietzsche brought forward of God is dead, which, by the way, there's a lot more to Nietzsche and his whole God is dead thing. We'll talk about that in a separate episode of the podcast. But it's not just that they were trying to grapple with the loss of God. The issue is they were trying to also grapple with the loss of the value structure that came with Judeo-Christianity. 
that had such a profound effect of giving order to society and, to a large extent, meaning as well. We also have modern psychology being born out of modernism with Freud and Jung. So you have psychoanalytic study for a great number of mood disorders that appear in modernism. And what were some of the things that the human psyche was grappling with? Well, in addition to that loss of God structure, you also have this this bifurcating effect of yearning or being pulled toward fragmentation. Everything seemed to be dispersed and fragmented. The human species was fragmented quite a bit, and yet also this yearning for reunification. And that created a kind of longing in the human being, in the human mind. And perhaps the best way to describe it is the way that critic Sanja Bahun beautifully states in the book Modernism and Melancholia, Modernist nostalgia, if such existed, was a melancholic nostalgia, a rebellious struggle with an unknowable lost object and the sometimes debilitating symptoms it has left in its trace, a combat which, as in every good psychoanalytic tale, binds the repressed trace of the past, the aberrations of the present, and the unpredictable future. All that to essentially say, there's a type of nostalgia involved here. And oftentimes we tend to look at nostalgia as a very positive thing. And it can be, right? If it's, if it's held in the right place. What I mean by that is, nostalgia is great for a brief moment in time. However, if you are living in nostalgia, it can be quite debilitating to the psyche because it means you're disconnecting from the present and denying yourself a future. And that's somewhat what was happening here in modernism because of this simultaneous fragmentation and longing for reunification. But there's also, the best way I can describe it is something of a heart of darkness here in modernism as well. There's a shadow that looms over it, and a stench of death and forlornness all around. We often call the generation that lived in this time the greatest generation, and with good reason. Although, given the chance, I'm sure they would have rather been born either a time before or a time after modernism. But make no mistake about it. The greatest generation was forged out of modernism and out of the difficulties that it had to deal with. So I've painted a pretty happy picture so far, right? Okay, let's deal with some good here. What can be good in a time period where so many things have gone wrong, where we've seen so much destruction and so much horror? Where do you look for good? The answer is you find pockets of goodness. And you hold on to them. Small gestures, like holding hands or sharing a smile or a laugh. Goodness in modernism becomes very small, very controlled. And it's not something that lasts. It's something that the people of modernism know is very fleeting. And it's understandable when you think of, again, those major events that happen at the time, Great Depression, World War I, you can't help but feel the oppressive weight of these horrible events. And so, what is there to be exuberant about? Not much. So you don't necessarily look hard to find good. You don't search for it. But when you do, it's usually something that's very small and controlled. But you're quite grateful for it. And that is something that we seem to have lost quite a bit today, is being grateful for our small pockets of goodness. Okay, so have I sufficiently bummed you out yet? No? Good, you're still listening. Excellent. So let's take a look at some modernist literature, actually. 
And let's unpack what's going on in these great pieces of literature here. I've got three things for you for today. We're going to take a look at T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is published in 1920. We're going to take a look at a section of Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage, which is published in 1895. And then we're going to take a look at a piece of literature that, technically speaking, was published during postmodernism in 1953. However, I would argue that it resides in this kind of neutral space. It has strong elements of modernism to it and strong elements of postmodernism. And so that'll be a nice text for us to use as a transition between modernism and postmodernism. And that's Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, published in 1953. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read sections of the two, the two latter pieces, Red Badge of Courage and A Good Man is Hard to Find. But I'm going to read the entire poem of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And as I do so, I want you to practice some of that active listening that we talked about in the first episode of the podcast. I want you to listen to what I'm saying, and when a thought strikes you, don't be afraid to pause. Pause the podcast and let it hit you a little bit. Think about what is being said and think about its utility for today. I have a couple of different sections of the poem that we're going to look at together, but really give yourself an opportunity here to practice just sort of listening and enjoying literature again, because it's a wonderful poem. Okay, here we go. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent, to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask. What is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair, with a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, 
And when I am formulated sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws, scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile? to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worth while? After the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow were throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool. Deferential, glad to be of use. Politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool... I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us, and we drown. So, what do you think? What thoughts popped into your mind as you heard this? Any particular lines stood out to you? Well, let me walk through some of these sections with you a little bit here so that we can develop some meaning that we can use for even today as well. The first section that I want to look at here is actually when the speaker says, I am Lazarus, come back from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. Of course, if you're familiar with the reference here, the allusion here, Lazarus is from the Bible. And Lazarus, of course, is raised from the dead by Jesus. So Lazarus has a kind of cosmological knowledge that we should all be interested in, right? If you could meet Lazarus and 
he tells you, I'm, I come back from the dead, I have something to tell you, you would think that we would all want to listen, right? We'd want to hear this information. Tell us, Lazarus, what is the afterlife like? And yet instead, you get this image of someone simply pulling a pillow up to their head and lying down almost and saying, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. This kind of dismissiveness of grand knowledge, of deep knowledge, of cosmological knowledge. And it reminds me of when I first heard that scientists had cracked the human genome. I can very specifically remember learning this information, and there were people around me at the time. And I kind of said, hey, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. You know, we've been working on this for quite a while, and this really could lead to some really great medical breakthroughs, right, that can help a lot of people. And I remember just the feeling that nobody really cared. <laughs> like, it wasn't really that big of a deal. Picture a kind of like Twitter feed almost thing, right? So you've got like, Kim Kardashian comes out with new line of clothing, We've broken the human genome. LeBron James scores 32 points in a finals game. And not to take anything away from Kim Kardashian and LeBron James, but that middle part there of cracking the human genome is a big deal. And yet, in some sense, news in general or information in general has all become mixed together and somehow equaled by this massive machine that we've created. And not just social media. Media, even before that, in general, was, was heading that route. We've made it so that all information seems to be equal. And so we can't find ways to share in great information. It's become more difficult than ever, even though we have more access to information than we've ever had. We're so fragmented, again, similar to modernism, fragmentation, we're so fragmented that we can't find ways to connect with each other for big news, you know, matters that are of great concern to all of humanity. There's also the part of the poem where the speaker sort of continually asks, do I dare? Do I dare or not dare to do something? Do I disturb the universe? The speaker says. What a fantastic idea, right? Do I disturb the universe? There's a problem of action in this poem and loss of heroism or loss of vitality here, right? One of the saddest sections, but the most, one of the most profound ones, is toward the very end, when the speaker says, I have heard the mermaids sing. I do not think they will sing for me. Of course, mermaids come from a lot of folktale stories, and they usually represent sexuality, vigor, excitement, and temptation. But more than anything, there, there's also, they represent temptation from your fate, from your glory. They'll pull you off of your path, your destiny. Will the speaker be pulled from his path of destiny? No. Because the mermaids no longer recognize him as a vital force. And we need, no matter what age we are, we need to preserve a kind of vital force, a sense of, of destiny, a sense of adventure, a path toward purpose. There are two things that you can never lose as long as you're alive on this world. You cannot lose hope and you cannot lose purpose. There's also this line that's easy to gloss over where the speaker says, I measure out my life in coffee spoons. And it's a great line because 
It's about how even our ceremonies at times, our ceremonial acts, which are supposed to be, ceremonies are supposed to be about sacredness, about rites of passage, big deals. And yet I know for myself, I have my morning routine, which has become a kind of ceremony, something that I can't live without, where I get up, I use the restroom, and then I go and I make my coffee, and I measure out my life (laughs) in coffee spoons. And I think of my poor wife who gets the most unromantic grunt of existence from me prior to my first cup of coffee in the morning. (laughs) And so there's a kind of loss, a loss of adventure in thinking about our everyday modern ceremonies. You know, I'm not going out and hunting a mythical beast. I'm just making coffee. (laughs) It's kind of a sad, a sad thought. And this is, again, some of the some of what the individuals in modernism were lacking were this kind of ceremonial connections to humanity, especially with the loss of religion that usually provided that kind of ceremonious, uh, the ceremonious reading of humanity or a ceremonious rites of passage in that way. We also see the extreme disconnect between humanity through a lack of language to be able to successfully convey feeling or meaning. You hear the speaker say, it is impossible to say what I mean. And you hear the people say, that is not what I mean, or that is not what I meant at all. And so what happens to human beings if we cannot use language to successfully convey how we feel? Think of of this. How many times today Do you hear someone say, you know, you just don't understand. You're not me. Oftentimes that can create a kind of frustrating connection between the two individuals. The one who is saying, you don't understand me. And the one who's standing there, who wants to understand the other person actually. So where is the failure in that? We have to accept the fact that it could be that the individual really does not have access to sufficient language to express their feelings. In which case, all the other person can do is actually accept that disconnect. Now, that's a pretty horrific thing to think about, isn't it? But you can see how that insufficient language to represent a feeling can create the kind of fragmentation that we talked about throughout this episode in terms of the modernist fragmentation, but also you can see how, again, in neo-modernism, in today, how this insufficient language to express how, we, how we're how we feeling about ourselves, a feeling of, of insufficient language to express our sacred self-narrative that we tend to create in neo-modernism, how that adds to the fragmentation that we feel even today. Because you never actually achieve genuine connections and genuine understandings with each other. Okay, let's move on to our next piece of modernist literature, and that is Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. If you've never read the novel, it's about a young man named Henry Fleming. And Henry wants nothing more than to join the Union Army in the Civil War and test his might in battle to earn his glory. Now, Crane uses a lot of Homeric language, meaning Homer from ancient Greek, the orator who gives us the Iliad and the Odyssey. He uses a lot of Homer in a sense to show that this is something that is almost built into our very DNA, that there's a kind of yearning to go to battle and to test ourselves with our life on the line. And what I want to show with this novel here is that in modernism, there's a kind of rethinking of what it means to be heroic. And you'll understand, I think, once we put it all into proper perspective here, why 
modernist thinkers thought that we might need to reconceptualize heroism. The first thing I want to do here, though, is I actually want to read a very brief section from the Iliad itself, from Homer, in order to set the scene properly for Red Badge of Courage. So the Iliad is an epic poem of the Trojan War, but more specifically, they kind of tell you in the very opening line of the, of the Iliad, what it's really about. And that is, Sing, O Muse, of the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles. In many ways, the epic poem is a story of rage. Not simply the rage of Achilles, but there's plenty of rage to go around in the epic. But nonetheless, Achilles, the great Greek warrior, finds himself at one point with a choice to make. And he's given that choice by his mother, the goddess Thetis. And here's what we read in the Iliad. Achilles tells us, My mother, Thetis, a moving silver grace, tells me two fates sweep me on to my death. If I stay here and fight, I'll never return home, but my glory will be undying forever. If I return home to my dear fatherland, my glory is lost, but my life will be long and death that ends all will not catch me soon. Okay, so Achilles sees two paths in front of him. If he stays and fights the Trojans, he will gain tremendous glory, and glory in the ancient Greek world was not riches. It was a sustainable narrative that could outlive your mortality. So if he stays and fights, he'll have, you know, a great victory. And of course, you know, if you've read it, he fights the great Trojan hero Hector and defeats him. But if he goes back home, if he chooses not to fight, he's going to have a long, prosperous life, a domestic life, but he won't have the glory of that sustainable narrative. Of course, Achilles stays and fights Hector and wins and gives back the body after he takes it and disgraces it to Hector's father, King Priam. And then Achilles is eventually shot in the Achilles heel, good job, by Paris, Hector's brother. And so we are, to this day, still singing the story of Achilles, whereas we're not singing the story of Achilles the farmer. So it's interesting how Homer fits this into he makes the <laughs> he makes this come to life of course by telling us the story of Achilles we are in fact sustaining his glory here well henry from the red badge of courage also has this path in front of him and it's henry's mother who also gives him in a sense this option between the two and there's a beautiful part here where the narrator of the story tells us what Henry's mother is thinking when she's told that he already enlisted behind her back. The narrator tells us she could calmly give him, meaning Henry, many hundreds of reasons why he was of vastly more importance on the farm than on the field of battle. Now listen to that language again for a second. Many hundreds of reasons. Crane could have easily said something like hundreds of reasons or thousands of reasons or many reasons. But listen to just the cadence of that again. She could calmly give him many hundreds of reasons. You can hear Crane trying to raise the level of his language here to an epic level to create this kind of cadence to show just how important this moment is. And more than that, It's not that she can just give him, Henry, important reasons, that there were vastly more important reasons for him to stay on the farm. You see, again, when you think about the major events of modernism, the extreme amount of pain, suffering, and death, the loss of so many families, so many individuals, it's easy to understand why in modernism, You have a kind of reconceptualization of heroism being a domestic one. 
rather than see your loved one go out and fight and die. There is something about the importance of keeping the family together. Now, that's not to take away from the importance of war sometimes. It's simply something that we can understand. And so you have this reconceptualization of the that there's heroism in domestic life. And the hope, of course, in that, what we can take away from it, is that when you are home and doing the best that you can to be a good member of your family, there is something there to take pride in. You are getting your medal tested in trying to be a good parent, good child, a good sibling. There is glory in that. Now, finally here, I want to take a look at a section from Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. And again, this is published in 1953, which technically puts it in postmodernism. However, there are very modern elements to it. And if you've never read the story before, I am going to spoil it a bit here, but I will just tell you Great literature is never spoiled. It doesn't matter if you know the ending. The path reading it, right? The actual journey that happens when you read it, that's the beauty. So if you've never read it, you should read it. It's quite an interesting text. I'll just kind of sum it up as best as I can by saying there's a family, and it's got a husband, a wife, and one little girl and one little boy. They're probably around 9 and 11. I think they give the ages, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. And there's also a grandmother as well, who's the mother of the husband. And the grandmother is a bit self-centered, bit of a scatterbrained individual, and she's able to trick the family, in a sense, in going on a trip to go see this house that she remembers as a child. So you've got, again, that longing that we talked about earlier for reunification, the kind of melancholy nostalgia. And on this trip, which turns out she has the wrong house, (laughs) she doesn't remember it correctly. On this trip, the family gets into a car accident and they get kind of trapped in a ditch Now, all the while that this is happening, there is a killer on the loose called the Misfit. And sure enough, as they're trapped in this ditch, a car shows up. Three gentlemen, and they get up, and I mean, they get out of the car, and they say, help those people out of that ditch, and they help them out. And then the grandmother says, I I recognize you, you're the Misfit. And you're like, Oh, Granny, why did you do that? And the two gentlemen who are with the misfit, they take the mother and daughter and then the husband and son out into the woods and they kill them. And you're just left with the grandmother speaking to the misfit and the grandmother is trying everything that she can to convince the misfit that he's a good man and that he comes from good blood and he doesn't have to kill her. And there's a religious element here to the story that doesn't often get discussed with as much attention as it as it probably should or it isn't given as much attention as it should because it tells us a lot about how the misfit becomes what he is. So let me just read it a couple of sections here of the very end. Finally, she found herself saying, Jesus, Jesus, meaning Jesus will help you. But the way she was saying it, it sounded as if she might be cursing. Yes, am the misfit said as if he agreed. Jesus shown everything off balance. It was the same case with him as with me, except he hadn't committed any crime and they could prove I had committed one because they had the papers on me. Of course, he said, 
They never shown me my papers. That's why I sign myself now. I said long ago you get a signature and sign everything you do and keep a copy of it. Then you'll know what you've done and you can hold up the crime to the punishment and see do they match. And in the end you'll have something to prove you ain't been treated right. I call myself the misfit, he said. Because I can't make what all I've done wrong fit what all I've gone through in punishment. So let's stop there for a second. In this brief section, you're seeing, you're seeing the convergence, in a sense, between modernism and, to a degree, postmodernism. In modernism, you do have a turning away from institutions, a kind of distrust. And the misfit here is saying, the institution, the justice system, couldn't really prove to me that what I had done deserved the kind of punishment that I received. There's this kind of imbalance in the world. Again, a kind of disconnect, if you will. And then he continues. He says, Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit continued. And he shouldn't have done it. He's shown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can. By killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said, and his voice had become almost a snarl. Think about this for a second, right? That longing for reunification, that loss of, of religion that takes place in modernism. The problem, and Nietzsche, again, he sort of saw this from the beginning. The problem is when you kill off that sacredness of God, you have to put something in its place, at least, in order to make up for the loss of values that come with it. And here you can, you can actually see the misfit. There's, there's a, a part in the story where the misfit says, if I could have been there, if I could have just seen it. And he's referring to the fact that if he were born when Jesus walked the earth and could have just seen it himself. He could be religious. He could believe. He would, he would be good. And of course, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you're thinking, well, there's your Doubting Thomas story, right? Thomas had to see in order to believe it. And Jesus tells him, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen the misfit is searching for that kind of belief, that kind of transcendence, something greater than the structure of flesh and bone and humanity. And when he can't find it, the only thing that can, that can fill that void of feeling is actually to do harm, to do evil. In some ways, because that seems, I think, more natural than to do good. Steve Pinkerton, the scholar, talks about this kind of idea a bit in his book, Blasphemous Modernism. And he kind of says, although most scholars tend to focus on the disconnect in modernism between the individual and religion, there is still this yearning for transcendence that I spoke about, right? And what Pinkerton talks about, essentially, is that there's also this yearning to be both loved and chastised by a godfather figure, to blaspheme, because that blaspheming is in a sense still a recognition of a kind of divine structure in place, of a kind of value system in place. Because by the end of modernism, all that is left is mankind. And who is more untrustworthy than mankind? And that will lead us into the skepticism of postmodernism.
So what can we take away from modernism? Well, no matter how bad things might seem in the world, there is good. There is hope. This neo-modernist world that we live in currently has many of the same character traits as modernism. Fragmentation, the yearning to redefine what it means to be human, which is why we are feverishly developing our sacred narratives of the self in order to establish and find meaning in an increasingly mechanized world. Modernism also shows us that language has been fragmented before, as it is now, where it seems like everything we say today is either insufficient to explain our feelings or it's whisked away by the people who, like in Eliot's poem, say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. There are still connections that need to be made between humans, that need to be strengthened, bolstered, and maintained. Perhaps the most pressing thing that we learn from modernism is that you cannot simply throw aside the importance of sacredness, that we need transcendence in order to believe in something greater than ourselves. However, we have to make sure that we are indeed transcending ourselves and not simply worshipping ourselves. Mankind often makes a poor choice for a deity. Finally, I would say we've learned to get the heck out of modernism as quickly as possible, because it's not exactly a place you should want to be. So for next time, let's move out of modernism and enter into postmodernism, a movement that is, um, interesting, to say the least. I thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you did enjoy the episode, please consider supporting my endeavor by leaving a positive rating, a kind comment, and or subscribing to the podcast on whichever platform you're currently using to listen to me now. Additionally, you can find me on joemeyer.substack.com and on the neutralgroundpodcast.com, where you can listen to episodes and contact me with a question or comment via email, or even leave an audio comment with some thoughts of your own. If your comment is particularly thoughtful and can spark some good thought in us, I'll use it on the show and we'll grapple with it together. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on the neutral ground and have a great day.